went up there. We came down. I contacted Brother Cosmonalgo through the observatory and asked him if he'd be willing to answer some of my questions. Um, a lot of what he gave us is in the book, and it has been astonishing, people. But all of the quotes that we make by him, just so people know, are not the quotes that he gave us personally. They're the quotes that are in his own book that he wrote, Intelligent Life in the Universe, Catholic Belief in the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligent Life, which was published by the Vatican-owned Catholic Truth Society, and then was almost immediately pulled from the market. And you cannot find that book anywhere. They put it out, they pulled it from the market, and there was even an intentional effort to go out and retrieve every copy that made it uh, into the public forum so that the book wouldn't be out there. This essay, Intelligent Life in the Universe, Catholic Belief and the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligent Life, was published in 2005 but removed almost immediately by the Vatican Truth Society, which is a publisher for the Holy See. That means that for approximately 10 years, this book has not been on the market in any way. And in fact, the Vatican Truth Society attempted to recall all of the books that were distributed. But since Thomas Horn's Radio Liberty interview in 2014, the book appears to have been reposted to the Vatican Observatory's own website. Why would they only now repost this work, and what's so controversial about it? Indeed, stories and speculations about races and beings other than humans are as old as storytelling. Ancient Greek and Roman myths were populated not only by gods, heroes, and demons, but by any number of strange and monstrous beings. Lucian of Samoseta in AD 160 wrote perhaps the first tale of travel to the planets, and he imagined various alien races living and warring there. As we will see, even the Bible talks about non-human intelligent beings created by God. I have to recognize that there is another reason why a lot of people are hungry to be visited by alien beings. Seeing a world full of pain, full of disease and warfare, injustice and poverty, they hope that somehow any race advanced enough to cross the vast distances between the stars and visit us must also be advanced enough to know how to overcome all those human problems. They look to the aliens to be the saviors of humankind. They look to the aliens to be the saviors of humankind. This is our chance to learn more about our planet and maybe even save it. What you've created here is incredible. They just cracked interdimensional travel. All exhibit unique physical conditions. I just want to fix my friends. You can't fix this. You should use these powers to help people. You open the door. You don't know how to close. You open the door. You open the door. You don't know how to close. You don't know how to close. Be ready for what's coming. What is coming? The answers. Be ready for what's coming. What is coming? The answers. The answers. You open the door. You don't know how to close. You don't know anything about what's coming. What is coming? Done. What is coming? Done. You open the door. You don't know how to close. You open the door. You don't know how to close. They just cracked interdimensional travel. They just cracked interdimensional travel. Interdimensional travel. This is our chance to learn more about our planet and maybe even save it. The key was hidden from the eyes of the world and is now found again by the purest of heart. The sacred guardians of the key were appointed by nature itself to protect the machine and guard its sacred purpose. Until a time came 
when humankind needed its power once more. This is our chance to learn more about our planet and maybe even save it. They look to the aliens to be the saviors of humankind. Breaking the energy chain can starve life to death. For instance, if an impacting comet or a nuclear war covers the Earth with a thick layer of dust, this would cut off sunlight to the surface, stopping the plant life and starving the animals that feed on those plants or feed on those animals. And of course, once you have plants and animals on a planet, they do tend to feed off each other, sometimes to the point of extinction. Without going into the details, it'd take another book. If there were some way, wormholes or warp speed or any other science fiction gizmo, that allowed one to communicate at faster than the speed of light, then we can show that eventually it would be possible to violate one of the most basic common sense laws of the universe, causality. In such a universe, it would be possible for an effect to occur before the cause. They just cracked interdimensional travel. Interdimensional travel. How much faster would communication become? We don't know. But in the meanwhile, don't hold your breath. I don't expect it to happen soon. Until it does, we are stuck with the fact that it might be impossible to converse with most of the universe over a human time scale. And God is outside of the universe, beyond space and time. Michelle? Casey, stay here! Master Splinter, what's going on? We've seen that kind of energy before. Recall. 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 And the Daimyo Sun. This is what we told you about, Master Splinter. They merged somehow, combined together. They merged somehow, combined together. All into one ugly package. We told you we would return. We told you we would have our revenge. We control time and space. We control time and space. Time and space. It might be impossible to converse with most of the universe over a human time scale. We are unbeatable! We're going down, Falcon! Oh, that jerk Nitro tore the hydraulic hose when he slammed us! We got no stabilizers! Think fast! There's a trap door when you need it! That's it! Way to race, Raph! Uh, Raph? Whoa! What was that? We'll be out of the glacier in five seconds. Better pick up speed. Why? There's a bit of a jump. Full throttle wrap! Already on! Why is he helping us? Who cares? We got a race to win! Way to win a race, partner! Hey! It's... it's happening again! It's pulling me away from here! Uh, Raph, listen! Just remember that if you do nothing else in your life, you were once a planet racer. Not everyone can say that. And you remember, race with honor. I'll remember, Raph. Winning without honor, that's just not winning. It isn't until page 33 that Guy Consul Magno begins to address the main thesis of his essay. Right at the top of page 33, there are unquestionably non-human intelligent beings described in the Bible. At least one famous group of such creatures are familiar to us all. They are in a relationship with God, they are capable of good and evil, and they are most certainly not human. 
they're called angels. And then at the bottom, he says, and these are not the only non-human intelligent creatures mentioned in the Bible. There's that odd and mysterious passage at the beginning of Genesis chapter 6 that describes the sons of God taking human wives. With it is a frustratingly oblique reference to the Nephilim, the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. We could be Whether you interpret these creatures as angels or aliens doesn't really matter for the sake of our argument here. The point is that ancient writers of the Bible, like all ancient people, were perfectly happy with the possibility that other intelligent beings could exist. They knew how limited their knowledge was. The world was a big place, most of it unknown and probably hostile. But that speculation is bounded by two facts which we accept as crucial tenets of our faith. First, whatever is out there, it is the creation of a loving God, and second, regardless of what God may or may not do with the rest of creation, nothing out there can contradict what we know he has done here for us. Of course, if you are really eager to find a reference to the extraterrestrials in the Bible, you can't do better than to look at John 10, 14-16, the famous Good Shepherd passage. I am the Good Shepherd, I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. Perhaps it's not so far-fetched to see the second person of the Trinity, the Word, who was present in the beginning, John 1.1. 1, 1 coming to lay down his life and take it up again, John 10:18. Not only as the Son of Man, but also as a child of other races? But all such cases in human history have dealt with creatures that were demonstrably human. Would other intelligences not related to human beings not arising on our earth still have souls? Would they need redemption? And was the death of Jesus necessary or sufficient for them? And having a soul has nothing to do with how many arms or legs or tentacles you have. Any creature capable of being self-aware and aware of others and free to make choices to love or not love based on that awareness has a soul. Now what does he say in the book? When I ask him, you know, uh, about those Catholic Church scholars that are talking about these aliens being moral, morally superior to us. And I said, where could you find an example of that in the Bible? And guess what? He points me to Genesis chapter 6, and he talks about the Nephilim and those fallen watchers. But he doesn't call them fallen. He refers to them as those who are more intelligent than we are, coming here from another world, and he compares them to aliens. I was just... I was astonished by that, and he also does that in his book. It's absolutely demonic, but he uses that as an example of those who might come to the earth again in the future who would be more intelligent than we are and capable of providing a greater revelation of God. So I found that to be just absolutely astonishing, right? So then I pressed him on that question, and he said, Tom, he said, have you not read John 1016, another sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they 
shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And he uses, he breaks that down. He does this in his book, Intelligent Life of the Universe, which again, if people need proof, I'll email it to them. Uh, he uses that to say, they shall hear my voice. Okay, they're closer to God than we are. They're going to come here, give us a better revelation, and we're all going to be one fold and one shepherd. So he sees the what we would call the second coming is basically an alien armada with their leader coming to say, I've been here once before. Perhaps it's not so far-fetched to see the second person of the Trinity, the Word, who was present in the beginning, John 1.1. 1, 1 coming to lay down his life and take it up again, John 10, 18. Not only as the Son of Man, but also as a child of other races. Now here is where it really gets astonishing. When I pushed him further, he says, perhaps, and this is a direct quote from his book, but he sent it to me in the email, he said, Tom, perhaps it is not so far-fetched to see the second person of the Trinity, the Word, who was present in the beginning, John 1.1, 1, 1. now he's talking about Jesus, coming to lay down his life and to take it up again, John 10.18, not only as the Son of Man, but also as a child of these other races. They look to the aliens to be the saviors of humankind. The Titan Prometheus wanted to give mankind equal footing with the gods. The Titan Prometheus wanted to give mankind equal footing with the gods. For that, he was cast from Olympus. For that, he was cast from Olympus. Well, my friends, the time has finally come for his return. You convinced me that if these things made us, then surely they could save us. If these things made us, then surely they could save us. It thus appears that the sons of gods are angelic beings, and the mysterious statement respecting them in the sixth chapter of Genesis seems to refer to a second and deeper apostasy on the part of some of the high ones on high. But these more daring rebels are not found among the spirits of darkness which now haunt the air. They no longer retain their position as principalities and powers of the world, or even their liberty but may be identified with the imprisoned criminals of whom Peter tells us that after they had sinned, God spared them not, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Jude also mentions their present condition in similar terms, and the context of either passage indicates with sufficient clearness the nature of their sin. They chose to leave their own world and having broken through God's limits into another to go after strange flesh. They chose to leave their own world, and having broken through God's limits into another to go after strange flesh. These are ancient civilizations that were separated by centuries, and yet this same pictogram was discovered in every one of them. They're smiling. I think they want us to come and fight them. I think they want us to come and fight them. These are ancient civilizations that were separated by centuries, and yet this same pictogram was discovered in every one of them. They're smiling. I think they want us to come and fight them. Therefore, he dashed them down at once to his lowest dungeons as an instant punishment of their impious outrage and to deprive them forever of the power of producing further confusion. Since we have no further mention of the Cainites as a separate tribe, and since of the Sethites, who must also have increased in numbers, but one person was translated to God from the evil to come, and only eight were saved through that evil, it is clear that the two families had at length mingled and intermarried seduced probably by the intellectual pursuits, the gay society, and the easy life of the wicked. The Sethites first found pleasure in their company, their luxuries, and their many skillful and ingenious inventions. And their many skillful and ingenious inventions were they enticed to yoke themselves unequally with unbelievers, and so being drawn into the vortex of sin, disappeared as a separate people. Sad and instructive was the result of this amalgamation, 
For when the time of dividing came, no true worshippers were to be found save in a single family of Noah. For when the time of dividing came, no true worshippers were to be found save in a single family of Noah. Men seem to have so prized their own wisdom, to have thought so little of God, that their religion had dwindled to a mere hero worship of their own famous leaders. Those who, Prometheus-like, brought to them by their inventions the necessaries and comforts of life, and so enabled them for the time to foil the purposes of the supreme power. My dear friends, judgment is coming and you better be ready.